I uh, uh, this is w- this was the theme of my thesis uh, that I wrote here in the, uh, <coughs> our academy, uh, uh, and I finished it last year finally after five years, and uh, I composed both kinds of music, uh, electronic and acoustic, and sometimes uh, it was. I w- uh, started here so coming up my with the idea uh, of, of here in what the is the difference <coughs> between academy. the main uh, uh, the key difference uh, between uh, acoustic music, music and last year, music and, uh, and, uh, and, and what are the main, uh, the main factors and what can we do with it, and maybe maybe we think of something, and sometimes and it was more of I was a thought experiment coming up with the idea of what is the difference between academy. the main key difference between acoustic music while composing contemporary music and what are the main factors. Schoenberg's letter, Arnold Schoenberg's letter, is that he recorded himself, um, and uh, he is angry about uh, the decision of the uh, editor to publish his Ode to Napoleon with a woman voice. And we'll come, we'll come to this uh, recording later on. But what we just heard was an acousmatic sound, as we uh, all understand. Acousmatic sound is the sound that uh, we just here and we do not see the real cause uh, what was what was uh, the cause of that sound uh, so um, uh, w- there are some conceptual grounds that uh, w- we will uh, look through about this uh, concept of uh, cosmeticness or acousmatism uh, so uh, mm, the invisibility of sound uh, the degree of uh, interaction between sound and image that's uh, what it could be the, uh, uh, the, the definition of acousmaticness or acousmatism. Uh, and uh, also it, it is the cause and effect relationship. So uh, the, uh, the loudspeaker erases uh, or detaches uh, the, the sound from its cause. So cause and effect has, has uh, the relationships uh, are, are, are jammed or scrambled in, in one way or another. Watching and seeing, so there, there's, uh, we'll, uh, it is also uh, connected with. Let's say if we have a con- uh, acoustic music, we see and we watch the performance, and we see the performer, let's say a violin. And if we have electronic music, usually we have uh, it. What we see is uh, if we have uh, if we hear some sort of a sound, and we know what is it made from or what is the cause of it. Uh, then it's one thing, and if we don't know and uh, uh, what what is the cause of that sound? It can already gain some sort of a cosmetic property to it. And uh, let's say if we know that, uh, well, suddenly we hear a scream behind the door, uh, and then uh, the ones that know uh, that there's some sort of uh, theater play rehearsal or whatever of a murder scene, uh, they would be <coughs> completely okay. And the ones that uh, don't know, they would think that there was some crime going on. Uh, also, it has a connection with the uh, believing, let's say. If we believe that that sound belongs to some this or that property, that, that already imposes some, uh, some or, or dissolves the acousmatic, acousmaticness from the sound, and we believe that it is uh, composed by is. And to this conceptual ground, too, is the uh, uh, idea that sound has a body. This comes from the uh, treatises or, or manifestos from the 20th century, especially by Edgar Varese and then uh, Luigi Russolo and John Cage. And uh, since 
the sound has a body, then we can say that so there is something beyond the sound itself. There, so there is some sort of transcendental state be beyond the sound, and and we can also while composing or while listening to music, we can s think about these things. So uh, also, the, I took uh, modestly borrowed the method from Jean Jacques Nathier of uh, uh, analyzing. Uh, music in three levels that he calls poetic, the, the level of uh, music uh, composi composition from the uh, composer's view, uh, and all his intentions, the neutral level, the level where uh, the piece itself is present, and uh, what uh, uh, the either in the score or, n or in a recorded medium or something like this, and aesthetic level, uh, the, the level of appreciation or listening, actively listening to the piece and and getting all all these uh, or not getting the messages that uh, that the author had in mind. Okay, so uh, we already uh, we talked about this that there are two musics. Let's say uh, nowadays we can separate it, and uh, nobody argues about this. It's acoustic and electronic, and uh, we can say that it's not only, uh, according to Natia. Uh, uh, differentiated uh, in aesthetic level, uh, that means in the performance level, but also in neutral level, so that electronic music uh, uh, lives in some sort of different mediums. Uh, usually the score question is, is always open uh, when we talk about uh, electronic music. What, how, what is the score or how, or is it post-compositional score or maybe the project itself is a score that what I argue usually that uh, and uh, usually, pr and well, the scores of Bach are quite, quite uh, open, and you can see. But of course, it's and there's uh, um, encoded things, and you have to decode it. Uh, but uh, let's say the projects the of electronic music are not so open, and, and authors do not, uh, uh, they they don't feel so open uh, delivering the projects uh, that really show what is inside the score or, or, or inside the piece. Uh, so uh, let's say, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the main thing that uh, the poetic level is different. The, 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 uh, I argue that uh, uh, composing electronic music uh, uh, is uh, uh, different from composing uh, acoustic music in, in one way or another because uh, we are thinking in some maybe different terms, different categories. And uh, so it, uh, uh, we think differently in, in terms of form uh, and and the other elements of, of creating a piece. So uh, also uh, we can talk about uh, the question of the source uh, and the cause. Is that what I mentioned before in, in acoustic music uh, uh, or in electronic music? So uh, wha when we listen to the thematic piece, we can ask ourselves and uh, make questions when, while we are in this uh, uh, emerged in, in the cosmetic atmosphere, let's say in this sphere. Uh, we, we, our mind is trying to decode and, uh, and spot the sound objects and, the, and their relations and what is the cause of their action or, or, or of their being. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say uh, this, this question is uh, a little bit different when we talk about acoustic music. Uh, usually it is uh, um, mostly uh, based on uh, the source and the cause, based on, on the spatial the relations between the listener and the performer. Uh, usually, uh, there, there are some effects of placing performance or performers off stage, uh, and uh, or moving them spatially, and 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 that's that's probably the most popular thing that is happening in uh, acoustic music. And this is the example of uh, Bronis Kotarich's piece, Last Pig and Rice, Part Three. Uh, it, it is. Uh, it was really famous in Lithuania <coughs> in the 70s when uh, the choir was. It was performed in the church. Uh, and the choir was moving around. It was. There were some spatial uh, elements happening, and and it's that's that. What I argue is the example of of some sort of de small degree of acousticness in uh, in in acoustic music.
sold it uh, or Florio uh, online, and of course it's much more uh, uh, impressive when when they see it live. And uh, once in a while we have this performance on special occasions in churches. Uh, so, uh, also another example could be of, of placing the the performance off stage. Of course, there are a lot of them in acoustic music, but uh, one uh, vivid example is the unanswered questions question by Charles Ayers, where on on the program notes he uh, uh, he says that the, the strings should be placed off stage and uh, and they, they resemble the silence of druids who know, see, and hear nothing. Uh, so. Uh, I bet you know all the piece, but uh, just listen to a few entry se few seconds of that. So we also have the acoustic properties uh, that sneak in uh, to acoustic music in one way or another. Um, okay, so uh, I have to be uh, faster a little bit. Uh, we have one hour, yes? So uh, uh, this leads to two idea, two, 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 two main thing that there are two not only musics but two paradigms, paradigms uh, uh, that that also resemble the acoustic and electronic uh, ideas. And the breakpoint between these paradigms and and the shift uh, may, might have happened in uh, 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 when the Edison era started. So uh, the uh, when the when the idea of or, or possibilities to record the sound and and replay and play it back uh, in other time other place uh, became possible, uh, so uh, we we can say that uh, since uh, the the we, s we during acoustic music we see performers and we have a lot of visual clue, uh, uh, clues and cues, uh, so. Uh, uh, the, uh, so the, the the foundation could could we can say it, it lies in the realm of um, sound of acoustic music and electronic paradigm uh, in one way or another gives uh, raises a question of uh, visuals and that's why we sometimes we have some sort of uh, 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 we, uh, visual decisions that come with electronic music sometimes they are successful sometimes not and that's the thing we have always to ask ourselves. Uh, let's say uh, the, uh, what is interesting that's happening in acoustic music is the masking of the electronic paradigm that sneaks in into acoustic music. And here I, I, uh, I uh, take an example from another Lithuanian composer, uh, he, Ritis Majulis, and his uh, vocal piece for eight uh, vocalists uh, that is composed in, in, in a manner of, of micro tonality, micro polyphony. Uh, micro rhythms and uh, the score looks like that and each uh, each performer has its own tempo uh, has its own uh, tone and they uh, they glisten uh, for forming uh, clusters of of non tempered sounds and and there are various tempo relations and what is happening that the computer uh, we, they have all uh, the click track and and a tone that in, in air and then that's how they can be in sync with their part and also produce uh, the totally acoustic result while the electronic uh, electronic uh, uh, algorithm is m mainly controlling and the, the main idea of, of the piece. So uh, that's uh, here we can see that the, the, the electronic um, paradigm uh, or acousmatic things are somehow sneaking into the acoustic music in, in an interesting way. Uh, so uh, a similar thing that uh, that uh, can be uh, found is uh, uh, the piece by Michael Gordon, Timber. Uh, I, 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 I think you know that piece. It's for six six mantras, and uh, and what is happening? Uh, this uh, they have constant pulses uh, and. Uh, constantly changing, but it's all also very acoustic, or totally acoustic piece. But uh, uh, what uh, and Michael from uh, he uh, when we had the performance, uh, the premiere of uh, Lithuanian premiere here. Uh, after some time, you start hearing the the resonances. They they form some sort of a voice-like uh, textures that no longer resemble pulse, but more or less some sort of drone and and some vocal things. And uh, here we can talk also about the acousmatic. Uh, effect when uh, you you see the uncanny bodies that have no uh, the the disembodied voices. Let's say that's that's another.
point of the of the acoustic sounds, let's say uh, that the, the the voice of Schoenberg that we heard before, and Michael himself, uh, I had a small talk with him about this thing, and he said, yeah, there is no no. Um, uh, sound processing hap happening while uh, amplifying the instruments, and we just have the resonances that that somehow emerge and form uh, voice-like things. Of course, maybe it was not very intentional, but I think he, it is exploited and and has a common effect. So. Uh, uh, jumping more to the uh, historical uh, ideas of the cosmeticness, uh, we have to talk a, a little bit about uh, Pythagoras because uh, that uh, that is how uh, uh, it was. Uh, uh, Pierre Schaeffer, uh, with his allies, they 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 took uh, this idea of Pythagoreanism and having the cosmetic uh, uh, notion. Uh, flourishing in in music, well, uh, because of that, uh, so uh, Acus, uh, uh, Pythagoras uh, has its own cult, and there were uh, the uh, certain acousmatic things happening there that we can also borrow and 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 somehow land on our musical uh, world. So first thing is that the cult was based on uh, these things uh, called acousmata, uh, the thing that is heard and. Uh, uh, there were shor short uh, tellings, sayings that they had to learn by heart. Then there were two kinds, or of course, main, but two main kinds more, but there are two main kinds of uh, disciples that were in the cult. There were a mathematicoi, the learners, and a cosmeticoi, the listeners. And uh, the ones that were listeners, uh, b besides other aspects uh, of their uh, presence in the cult, they were uh, uh, listening to the, uh, as most of you know, uh, to the teacher behind the veil. So they were mostly uh, focusing on the act of listening, and uh, we can s say it was active listening or creative listening. So the visual clues uh, uh, and cues did not um, distract them from from concentrating on what uh, what they were hearing. So uh, another uh, concept we can uh, talk about and take and think when we compose acousmatic music or uh, acousmatic uh, properties uh, that emerge in the in the acoustic music. This is the veil, the Pythagorean veil. What is uh, uh, that boundary that separates, uh, let's say, the the cause and effect? In this case, if we talk about the electronic music, so the veil the concept of veil then falls onto the uh, the, the loudspeaker that that somehow masks the the original cause, and then we just hear the result or the effect. Uh, so uh, also uh, we can say that that acousmatico, uh, as I mentioned, is some sort of creative listening practice that is also a, 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 a thing that uh, a lot of electronic music theoreticians, uh, the academic or experimental electronic music. Uh, to, um, Theories talk about uh, the, the active listening, or the Pierre Schaeffer is talking about reduced listening, where you just uh, listen to the sounds as they are, that, or as John Cage said, let the sounds be themselves. Uh, some ideas that uh, also emerge uh, uh, from uh, in the in the theory uh, of uh, sound in cinema is. Uh, is there is a, a great output by Michel Chion that is. Uh, uh, was uh, studying with um, uh, at uh, Pierre Schaeffer, and uh, he he came up with his own very interesting ideas and wrote a lot of texts on on the sound in the cinema and and uh, the uh, acousmatic sound in general. And uh, his uh, vocabulary is quite vivid, and we can uh, he he's talking about audio visual contract that is happening in the in the movie, but we also can think that it, it is also happening in uh, acousmatic. Uh, music uh, uh, realm. Uh, so uh, that is, uh, let's say, in the, the that contract means that uh, we somehow the the creator and the uh, viewer or listener agrees that the visual and the sonic events that happen in the movie they are somehow uh, uh, happening in the same time and in the same place. Uh, that is usually not true. Uh, also, the audiovisual illusion uh, that is. Uh, the uh, when the sounds and the, the the images they produce some sort of the uh, illusion of 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 happening together something the same the synchresis when we have some sort of synthesis and syn synchronic uh, events happening in the sound and in in the uh, image uh, they seem to happen together or belong to each other. 
some added value paradox. The more uh, sound adds some some or contributes to the to the image, the more image becomes uh, uh, impressive. And uh, the more we think about image, not uh, about the sound, that what he says. And uh, the notion of acousmetre, so that's that is the the disembodied voice or the the, the voiceover or the the, the philosophical uh, idea of the of the uh, voice that is not seen. So we we can say that this is some sort of uh, spirit that has all the powers that uh, are possible. And uh, so and as long as we don't see it, so that's the, that this voiceover that he has in the in the image, but also um, I, I wrote one, some sort of a radio play in for the sphere. And, uh, and uh, well, we were listening to it in the dark and then I was treating it as, as acousmeter that can do anything uh, while being not visual. And of course, uh, Michel Sion is saying that uh, whenever we the acousmeter is deacousmatized or uh, seen, then it loses all its powers and something like that. Uh, so the, there's uh, his famous diagram of what is happening in the movie, that there is some sort of on-screen events and sounds that, that uh, are present in the uh, vi uh, visualized zone, as he says. Then, uh, then he says that there are some uh, s uh, sounds that are diegetic and, and, uh, or the music that is diegetic that uh, is, uh, belongs to the narrative or to the story uh, and also non-diegetic that, uh, that is, uh, belongs to some other, other universe. Let's say it's uh, music that uh, is not uh, from the radio uh, or, or but is for recorded, uh, not radio f uh, from the room that uh, the, it's being shot, but let's say it's recorded in the symphony orchestra, it's recorded in a studio, though we see a jungle that uh, that uh, clearly is understandable that there's no symphony orchestra in the jungle. So, and these two do zones belong to the acousmatic uh, area. Uh, some uh, other aspects that I analyzed in, in my thesis uh, are acus the uh, idea of acousmatization and deacousmatization. Uh, very simply speaking, it is uh, something that is, let's say, in the case of acousmatization, we, we start hiding something and we don't see, uh, in very primitively speaking, we, let's say we have a violinist and it's, it, it is performing and leaving the stage and we still hear it. Well, uh, an opposite, the acousmatization would be that uh, we heard some sounds uh, off stage and then it appears on stage. But also in the poetic level, if we talk about the method of Jean-Jacques Natier, uh, we can say that uh, there could be some structures that are, let's say, hidden, and then they emerge in, in the composition or uh, um, in the vice versa, they, they or opposite. They, they, they submerge and dissolve, let's say, the structure. So in this case, uh, there is this... Um, uh, this uh, Canon X or a two num study number 21 by Conlon and Karov, where we have two two uh, two planes, two two rows of music that is uh, one is really fast and another is really slow, and then they they change their their uh, uh, during the course of the piece they change the. Uh, uh, the, their functions and another uh, increases in speed and uh, and uh, the uh, uh, other slows down and uh, well we can argue that there's some sort of acousmatization <coughs> and deacousmatization happening in the piece of course uh, there are other ways to explain what is happening composition wise uh, but in this case uh, if we come up with this some sort of concept uh, we can spot and put our finger on that uh, i i'm not playing this piece because uh, if you can listen to it online uh, let's say another uh, example that uh, also uh, can be put under the, the umbrella of acousmatization or deacousmatization is the piece by Robert Pascal uh, for uh, four uh, violoncellos. And uh, in this case, we have uh, an interesting case of, uh, let's say, remixing or quotation, but uh, he uses uh, uh, the uh, material from, uh, f from other piece and uh, and uh, it emerges or deacousmatizes very very uh, very briefly in, by by the end of the piece
Okay. We'll go on. We can find it online. And this he uses a quotation uh, uh, of uh, some uh, this uh, uh, the the piece by Lassus, Carmina Chromatico, the opening. It emerges uh, from from these glissandi uh, at the at the some the peak points of the piece. And So I, I, I argue that there is some sort of uh, uh, acousmatic operations happening on where you uh, deacousmatize some sort of material or you hide it on. Uh, one of the um, uh, op uh, the notions that also come together with the acousmatic uh, or, uh, idea is, you can meet it uh, quite often in the texts right now, is uh, quite trendy, let's say, uh, text, uh, the, the notion of uncanny, uh, in English is uh, unheimlich, uh, da, uh, or um, in Lithuanian is neyoka. Uh, some uh, so uh, first it appeared in the text of Ernst Jensch on psychology of the uncanny. Then Sigmund Freud das unheimliche in 1919. And uh, basically it is uh, the idea that uh, there's some sort of psychological state uh, uh, or a doubt as where to an apparently living. Being is really animate or uh, opposite the the doubt as whether a lifeless object may in fact be uh, animate. So uh, if we port this uh, these two uh, uh, ideas into into our music realm or in music composing, especially in the composition of uh, electronic music or contemporary music, we can we can uh, work with these uncanny uh, aspects. Uh, let's say uh, either we we dissolve the the sound of piano into something. Uh, let's say we we can say it was a live living being. Let's say a piano was we we knew what it is and then we don't know and that's it. Or opposite, uh, the, the the scattered sounds or the grains come into the sound of a flute or whatever. Or of course, it's much more effective when it's used with the with the voice. And here we come to the idea of automatism and the, the the relation between the man and machine that also is discussed in in the in the text, by, especially by Freud, where he's uh, talking about uh, the. Uh, the um, uh, Hoffman's piece about Olympia uh, doll, and uh, here we can uh, we come to broader uh, fields of the sp spirituality of music and uh, the let's say the machine and its spiritless properties. So uh, and then uh, there's this. Uh, uh, it was interesting article that uh, triggered a lot of uh, thoughts and new texts, uh, especially in the music field. Uh, that was written by uh, uh, by Japanese robotic uh, scientist, and uh, here uh, we talk. Uh, we can we see the industrial robot that uh, we don't uh, don't feel too much connections uh, human wise but when we, we see a humanoid robot it it gets uh, some familiarity for us and uh, um, uh, Masashiro Mori in 1970 he he had this article that uh, it was called uh, the uncanny valley and uh, here's uh, that uh, uh, well, uh, the diagram where, where he says that uh, the, the, the vertical axis is uh, familiarity uh, of uh, with, 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 of the robot with us, and and then uh, the the horizontal axis is the human likeness uh, uh, axis. So industrial robot is uh, not uh, looking as a human, uh, 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 simply speaking. So we don't uh, uh, have too much familiarity with it. And if we come up with some sort of humanoid robot that has some two hands and two eyes and two legs, then our familiarity. Uh, rises, but uh, the more it's uh, looking as a human, so we not we start uh, seeing not uh, the small aspects of it being looking as a human. Uh, let's say the the hands and and eyes, but let's say m more the the discrepancies and the differences uh, that the, it's not human. Let's say it's re looking really as a human, but we see it's not human because it has some sort of different texture of skin or or movements. And then uh, Masashiro Mori he says that uh, it uh, loses and uh, the familiarity in the familiarity scale or in mostly into the negative side. Uh, let's say if we uh, if uh, um, 
uh, there's some sort of we we see that it uh, it looks like human but it has no liveliness and and in this case he says that the bottom ones are is the corpse or or the zombie and then uh, the more and then uh, since we pass that gap we we already the familiarity also starts to rise uh, he says uh, that uh, if it is a moving object it has more effects in the familiarity and it's more broad and the the the, the span is much bigger and we also can uh, can uh, hear this uncanny valley uh, op uh, notions in in the uh, uh, Graphic design, especially in animation, where try, people trying to recreate the human likeliness in in, in animation movies, and and it's uh, it's uh, the, it, there's much more familiarity when we see Shrek, either when we see a person that ha was motion captured and and tried to they were tried they tried to recreate the the real human, and it's not human actually. So uh, what, uh, what, does, what can you do with the music? I, I leave it more or less open, but we can plot some of the ideas of the acousmatic test also here. So uh, if we have some mechanical sounds or uh, they are, the sounds are uh, some sort of uh, uh, not trying to resemble the real instrument or real voice, uh, we, we stay somewhere here and maybe uh, the, the, this uh, hill over there may, might resemble some some mechanical uh, aspects uh, that are dominant in the in some so styles of the music, or it can be EDM or w any of these kinds. And let's say uh, uh, the zombie part could be the 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 general MIDI sounds that that try to resemble the symphony orchestra and then and so on. But uh, it's it's quite open. But uh, sometimes it's it's uh, interesting to to put it together and and to think. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, here I, I came up with, the, with some theoretical outlines of the acousmatism acus in uh, in 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 the music. That where can how can we plot it in in the music? So uh, there are some three hypothetical dimensions that uh, we can. Uh, Place any piece. Of course, it's quite vague, and it, it needs more, more, uh, more instruments. Uh, well, uh, to uh, to analyze. But we already, after composing or before composing, we can ask these questions: so What what is the visuality of our piece, or what is what what aspects are visible, what uh, aspects are not visible, and we can uh, put uh, our ideas in this plane and and maybe play with them. Uh, then what, uh, what are the audible and inaudible aspects? Let's say uh, if there is some sort of um, uh, meta music uh, uh, additional materials that, that come with it, or maybe there are some structures that we perceive uh, uh, in, in this uh, while actively listening, but they are not uh, present uh, if we put our po uh, finger on the wave file, let's say, like this. And what uh, what are the aspects of known and unknown? Uh, that's that's quite the, the deepest and and the vaguest part. But maybe we already uh, some some sort of information uh, changes the way how we listen to the the piece. So. Um, uh, make it faster. Uh, so, uh, if we talk about the visual, non-visual axis, so uh, we, uh, I call this vertical axis of acousmatism. Uh, so, uh, there are the uh, extremes. Uh, on one extreme, we we have pure acousmatism, the side, uh, sound without side, and uh, here we can plot our the the most uh, most uh, reduced listening according to Schaeffer and. Uh, and on the other side, we can say maybe theoretically it's, it's possible. The same like mathematicians think of more dimensions for, let's say, topography. We can also think of more more ideas that can be present, but they actually quite present uh, is inverse uh, acousmatism uh, or muted bodies uh, or objects. So we we somehow it is a musical piece, but it does not have sounds. Uh, and uh, of course there there are uh, pieces by uh, by. Uh, by quite a lot of composers that that uses uh, visu visuals without sounds and then even uh, or some motions or gestures and and uh, and other things uh, also uh, spatiality is living in this area too where it depends uh, how do we spread the sound in the in in the uh, visual axis and let's say if we talk about uh, our sphere uh, so uh, it's uh, it's spatial, 
yes, well, no, but it's also visual, and sometimes it, we keep thinking and, and trying to uh, imagine how do we uh, uh, solve the visual question here. Uh, let's say if, we, if you, sometimes you see the, the pieces that, that use uh, the, the multiple arrays of loudspeakers, they, they also pro make some sort of visual uh, uh, clues, cues to, to which, which speaker is talking now, and uh, and uh, uh, that that helps creating the speciality in 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 the piece. Um, okay, so the horizontal axis uh, we can we can put a lot of things in there. What is audible, not audible, even in the uh, frequency wise. We uh, of course uh, when of course we we can uh, say that uh, if we increase well go up in the frequency scale, we we uh, our pulse becomes a drone, and and there are two. To opposites uh, of 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 the frequency where uh, where the rhythm and sound reside together, the same that what Stockhausen was saying in his texts. So uh, uh, there are other philosophical ideas about the uh, sine wave uh, of one frequency. Uh, according to Fourier, it should last forever, and Dirac delta function. I'm not very big mathematician, but it's uh, the infinitely short impulse. And it, it uh, officially or theoretically contains all possible frequencies. So uh, here, if we jump to the more philosophical uh, ideas or let's say poetic level uh, of our composing, we can think uh, about the um, drone and pulse in 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 uh, any kinds of 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 uh, of. Uh, 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 of words, let's say uh, drone could be the evenly changing anamorphism or crouching beast uh, or as lava if we you talk about uh, Jens and Freud and the eerie stillness and here we have uncanny or a slow coming to life or dying, we have some sort of slow process of, of changing this, the, the living state of an object, in this case the sound object, and then uh, the, we can say this, um, this is some sort of passive charge of the uncanny, and uh, the, the, we can say about that the extreme value of drone, it also points toward the, some sort of transcendental state in, 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 one, in one direction, and uh, pulse uh, or impulse-based sound, it, 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 it could be opposite to drone with the, its eternal cycle of life, some, some uh, really, really uh, po poetic uh, words in this case. Uh, we have some perpetual motion and rhythm uh, we can say it, uh, like Mayer says, it both organizes and is organized uh, by uh, uh, all the elements that create the, and shape the musical processes. Uh, so uh, uh, the extreme value of pulse. So we have we need to have some sort of uh, opposites. So it's if a drone could be transcendental and moving beyond the sound. So maybe the pulse is. Uh, more immanent, and uh, we we uh, we get inside the the sound, not outside the sound. Well, it's just uh, uh, some some ideas that we can think of. And then the diagonal axis is the knowing and uh, not knowing, or knowing and believing. So uh, here we we talk about our poetic ideas, the how we put our structures, or do we want to show the structure how it is, or maybe the structure is hidden, or maybe we have some sort of uh, small hints that the structure is present, but we it is the, uh, theoretically acousmatized and we don't see that structure. That's uh, the, the, it is all in the discretion of the author. Uh, so, um, so to make it uh, more brief, we can say that, uh, so, uh, I, I argue that's the creative starting point for any creative operation. And uh, here uh, we have not sound objects, but semantic objects, uh, how you put uh, your piece together and what kind of semantic objects present there. And uh, here we can borrow other things from psychoanalysis or the, the idea of absence or the lack that is quite uh, uh, prominent in Lacan's, Jacques Lacan's texts, uh, that the even not the presence of something, but the lack of something can drive uh, uh, us forward, or in this case, that drive the piece forward. So, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, here 
we can uh, put uh, together our, our manifestos that I mentioned before, is the, the liberation of sounds by Russolo and Cage, the independent existence of sounds, and uh, I have to mention uh, Varese that he says that music is the corporalization of sounds uh, or the corporalization of the intelligence. That's what he says. And also, um, if we talk about Cage, then we have to talk also about the idea of non-action, the Wu Wei, so let the sounds be themselves. And uh, let's say uh, that's also, uh, this can be illustrated by uh, the famous piece of Alvin Lucier, where we have uh, a lot of uh, aspects. You, you all know that piece, so, uh, but it, it is, uh, that's the score for the piece, by the way. He wrote it himself. <laughs> so, uh, so this is, uh, so this is uh, the idea of, uh, you know, uh, disintegration or the acousmatization of, of a human voice, let's say it dis dissolves into, into some, some, uh, some resonances and, and we have, uh, we can, we can analyze this acousmatically more or less uh, by using these ideas. Uh, and um, my favorite piece, and I, uh, it's a piece by uh, Peter Ablinger, the, I mean the short excerpt from his cycle is Speaking Piano, and we all know, we all heard Schoenberg, and uh, then he, he uses, you probably know that, that piece where he uses the recordings of, of, of some famous speeches, and then it is being transcribed uh, for the piano and played by, by player piano or, or the mechanical uh, part that plays on the piano. So it's resynthesized on acoustic piano. And what, again, uh, I really enjoy, and it's interesting where the, uh, the, the electronic paradigm is hidden, and we, the result is purely acoustic instrument, but it's impossible to play without uh, electronic or computer uh, help. So let's let's listen to this piece a little bit and. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, and uh, let's listen to the original once again. And well, uh, here we have some sort of acousmatic voice, and Miss yeah, so that's that was the orgi original. In spite of my protest, you have published Leibovitz's performance. Of okay, so um, uh, okay, that's we already talked about that. So. Uh, one thing that we can also uh, blend all these texts and theories uh, in favor for our electronic and acousmatic music is uh, uh, when we talk about the, these uh, semantic objects and the knowing and not knowing and uh, structuring our composition beyond or that is detached from all the sounds and visual clues. So uh, uh, we have some sort of a meta construction that uh, maybe it's present or not and we can, we can play with that or either it is uh, Freudian Olympia, the, the doll that, uh, that is inanimate <coughs> automaton uh, that also creates some sort of acousmatic uh, uh, aspects there or um, repressed objects from we come to the uh, psy psychoanalysis uh, where, or the, the great other, uh, we can connect it with the acousmeter, let's say uh, ac film theory. Psycho psychoanalysis and we are here with the music but also there is some sort of connections that we can do and let's say acousmeter is of course the voice or, or some sort of a, a omnipotent uh, object in the sound that we can create and of course we can do it with, with this uh, spatialized sound. And the most interesting thing and it's very simple it is the boundary. Maybe uh, I, I think that's if we come uh, the, the, the more we show uh, what is the boundary of, of the piece, we, the more we expand the piece to the, to the limits, uh, the more it is vivid and the more it is uh, uh, convincible. Uh, so uh, we can ex expand it to the limit where we can say that here it's the, the piece is already full and it is enough and we can we can, uh, we can show that, let's say, our acousmatic ideas cannot go any further. And uh, 
uh, using some sort any kinds of uh, poetic operations, let's say systematic and non-systematic approach to composition, or using some error aesthetics or aesthetics of failure, we can say, or theatrical action and and other stuff. Uh, okay, so uh, some resources that uh, maybe if you are interested, you can read read more is uh, Michel Chion that I mentioned is a music the film. Uh, f uh, sound and film. Then Brian Kane just recently re released uh, the, his book on just acousmatics. It's called acousmatic. Uh, uh, no, not it's. It's called Sound Unseen. Sound Unseen by Brian Kane from Boston. And uh, uh, well, some uh, these guys I just mentioned that also mentioned uncanny in in their own fields is Jens, Freud, and Heidegger, of course. Uh, if we go deeper, both uh, all of them they they take some ideas from phenomenology, from Husserl, or or Lacan. Uh, of course, we have our semiotic star, Algirdas Julius Gremas, and some other guys that that do semiotics. And sometimes we can we can think of the ideas of of how we can uh, uh, place the meaning in our uh, composition. Thinking about acousmatics or, or unseen sounds is uh, Natier and Tarasti and Agavo. Of course, they they have their own traits of semiotics, but but it it is something to read. Thank you. Qu questions? We we still have time. Okay, uh, one, or two one, two questions. You had something? Yeah, uh, I just wonder, <coughs> Kevin, did you <coughs> get what you were, was your definition on acousmatic music? Because uh, I thought it was more like uh, about not only see, not seeing, but that, that is actually the source of the sound is unclear. So sort of the, uh, to, to difference between just a recording of a jazz band or something, which is not acousmatic music, but you cannot really see the source. And I also then didn't understand what you mean by the, the, the string instrument pieces. What What is acousmatic about, about them? I kind of I well, uh, saw the words. Okay. Explain. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's a good question. I, I say uh, first thing that acousmatic idea, uh, in, in my case, I detach it from the genre. And I take it just just very technically first. That is uh, the source is unseen. So uh, it can be uh, acousmatic music. We all we all know what is acousmatic music, but it it is uh, it is as it is a genre. Let's say we all agree with that. But we can say that acousmatic sound is detached from the genre and it's on itself. And and uh, the property is present in any recording if we just don't see the symphony orchestra that we listen. So that's acousmatic sound. And then uh, the same like we, we talk about sonata and the sonata uh, as a genre or as a form or, or something sonata sonata-ness in, in some other aspects of music. So that's what I'm looking for, for some acousmatic aspects in all kinds of music and especially in the composition. How can we think about it? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? So we're done for today. I. I, I <laughs> I, I, I give uh, a microphone to our next speaker then.
lecture <laughs> by Henry. Who was here, I think, together with Ken. Yeah, many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so, uh, by a very, uh, uh, by pure coincidence, I think my uh, talk will attach quite neatly to uh, Jonas's uh, just before, and this is pure luck. Um, and this is, uh, I mean, I should really say that this is, this is something that I'm working on right now, and uh, so it's a bit experimental. So these are, uh, I think maybe could be regarded as uh, thoughts that I have that I want to share with you. And uh, so I'm interested in any, any kind of feedback uh, that I can get. So uh, the listening mind, so the point here is I'm taking a, 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 a sort of a, a cognitive perspective on, on what spatialization uh, may be or may even not be, perhaps, and leaning on a few dif different uh, theoretical frameworks um, that I will uh, get to, but I will start with a, just a brief overview of, um, of the of the field so that so immersive and multidimensional sound based art creates spatial images that lie within the listener's mind and few forms of art are more evocative of spatial relationships than the sonic arts so that's a statement so that's a sort of a, a frame for me uh, here that um, this is a fact this is a fact that when I hear sound it creates spatial images uh, in my mind. There are obviously many, many aspects of this, and uh, I could think of at least one way uh, in which I could argue against this, but just for the sake of clarity now, I will stick to this uh, definition to have a, a framework in which we can have this, this discussion. So many aspects of sound production are uh, related to uh, to this. Uh, so there's a there's this virtual aspect. There's a virtuality of sound. It's not. I mean, we can't see it. There are virtual properties to it that emerge in, under different um, under particular circumstances, and sometimes not. There's an interactivity aspect of it. Uh, so, you know, perhaps then uh, leaning on, on Bishop Berkeley's definition of that the tree that falls in the forest, if no one's there to hear it, there is no sound. So sound only exists if I, if I interact with it. Uh, there's an immersive aspect of it. Sound can make us feel immersed in an event through sound. And we know this because we can take away the, the actual event and play back the sound and the speaker, and we can still be evoked. We can still evoke this, this sensation of immersion. And there is an aspect of narrativity. So there are some meaning. <coughs> there is some, some meaning that may be communicated through sound. And that meaning can have different articulations, and it can sort of be played out in different ways. But there is an aspect of narrativity to sound and music. So then a question that, that, that I'm asking then uh, is, so can a notion of space as a defining topic on an expansive horizon for sound-based artistic research provide openings for a deepened understanding of both the production and the perception of electroacoustic music? So that last part of that electroacoustic music may be too narrow, but I think there's a lack of terminology here that we suffer from when we are trying to have this discussion. Because you know, you say music, and then that becomes too broad. You say electroacoustic music, that becomes too narrow. I think acousmatic uh, sounds is a, is a perhaps better would have been a better term here. Not sure, but so the notion is that space. <laughs> 
has an impact. So the perception of space and sound has an impact on the way that we understand uh, sound. And if I can understand the ways in which it can impact on my uh, understanding of sound, if I can understand that better, I can also understand the different ways in which I can interact with music or I can create music or I can uh, listen to music. So in this sense, uh, oh, hang on, what happened? Oh yeah, no, that's right, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so in this, in this sense, space is an integral part of sound. It's not possible to imagine sound uh, without space. And this is, uh, this is interesting because in a lot of the theory, in a lot of the music theory that we have, uh, the spatial aspect of music has not received a lot of attention. It's almost like you know, one of those things like the, about 30 years ago uh, when I started as a music student, uh, there was a lot of talk of how rhythm had been subordinate to harmony, for example, in music theory. Now that there has been some advances in, in that field, but so now uh, I think it's fair to say the space, the spatial properties of music has been subordinate to the temporal aspects of music. So then the, the, the spatial properties of sound is obviously, as we've been talking about here yesterday, as Mantas was talking about here yesterday, is, uh, is fascinating in a space like this because we can create space. We can artificially create space and we can uh, manipulate space in sound uh, that has space coded into it. We can turn it into another kind of space. And... So again, at the lack of a better word, if we call this kind of activity creative spatialization, uh, that has a few obvious goals. To freely be able to localize uh, sounds in a virtual listening space, or factual for that matter. It's also to arti articulate sound as an object convincingly from a 3D perspective. So that I can create a, a, a sound and I can articulate it convincingly as something belonging to a particular place in space. And to create a spacious and immersive musical experience. The kind of, of, of sensation that we have when we go to the concert hall or we stand by the sea and we hear the sound, that kind of, 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 of uh, uh, emotion, emotional relationship to sound that we are immersed in. Now, uh, this may seem simple, but it's not actually uh, that simple because, and this, uh, I would come back to this uh, later, that the human mind plays a lot of games uh, with, uh, uh, with us when we perceive sound. So there are certain operations in this field that I that seems to me to be completely impossible to do, uh, because the way we hear a particular kind of sound just has a particular kind of space or spatial articulation embedded in it, and no matter what I do to it, it will still convey that space. You know, the sound of the ocean, for example. It would be really, really difficult in this space to say that, well, the sound of the ocean should come from there. Because when we hear the sound of the ocean, we hear a wide space. And, and the mind just creates that wide space. So it's, it's really difficult to, to get by. <clears throat> now, we may think that this is new, but of course, uh, very little uh, is new. Uh, and spatial environments have been created in in a lot of um, um, in a lot of different contexts. I think you know there are these cave paintings, these these this, these earliest artistic explorations of of humans uh, in these caves in France, uh, where you can see people playing flute uh, in the cave. So. I imagine that people were actually playing in caves because it sounded really cool uh, with that reverberation, you know, as compared to standing in the middle of a field 
where it didn't make that kind of sound. Okay. So, you know, I think it's fair to say that space has been part of music ever since humans started making music. <laughs> Cathedrals, uh, you know, employ the, the a political dimension of space, the littleness of the man in relation to the hugeness of God's room and the organ. Uh, as a political uh, definition of, of, of space. Concert halls, obviously, on echoic chambers uh, more recently. And, oh, let me just see if I didn't miss no, yeah. okay. So historically, musical works with spatialized groups and musicians have been composed, including pieces by many, and this has been going on for a long time, which Jonas was talking about too. So there's Mahler, Ives, <clears throat> we had a good example of just before Stockhausen, obviously Varese, Sinakis, um, and uh, Cage, uh, and uh, yeah, Kutavichus, like Jonas was talking about, um, another example. Um, and perhaps the most uh, commonly explored space for multi-channel audio is the cinema. And in, I mean, as early as 1940, uh, Disney made a multi-channel version of Fantasia, uh, four-channel. Uh, this is Cinerama. The, the first versions of Cinerama had, uh, I forget how many, but, but quite a few number of speakers behind these sort of... Uh, what is it called, the uh, panorama sort of screen. Star Wars, uh, a true landmark in spatial audio when it came in 77. And of course, George Lucas participated in creating the multi-channel surround formats for cinema <coughs> with his own company. And then onwards to the cutting edge development of today's immersive 3D spaces, which you know, IRCAM has come to epitomize this new concert hall paradigm. We have ZKM uh, in Kazu. Sork has been mentioned a few times already. Uh, there's uh, in uh, Graz, a fantastic space. Uh, there's this space here. And in Stockholm, we have a, uh, a dome uh, like this. So, so of all of these uh, constructions, uh, th their ultimate applications are intended to explore the possibilities of artistic expression in space. Everything from the caves up to these kinds of multi-channel uh, systems. And Commonly, the, the, the overarching goal of increased oral realism is coupled to the imaginative potential for hyper, hyper, hyper or surrealistic effects so that we can create hyper reality or we can create surreal effects uh, with the same kind of technology. So in parallel to technical innovations, there are important contributions to spatial thought originating in sound art and and this is, I, I, well, my feeling is that this is sometimes forgotten, but in, for that reason, I was really glad that, uh, that Jonas brought up Alvin Lucy. But many sound artists uh, emanating from the visual arts uh, field have worked with similar uh, sort of uh, spatializing techniques and despatializing techniques. Uh, Michael Asher, Marianne, uh, Marianne Macher, and Christina Kubisch, Ryoji Keda, uh, the Swedish sound artist Osa Schäna, who's been doing a lot of interesting uh, stuff in this field, which is not taking place in concert halls or, or, or listening rooms like this, but in the real world, if there's such a thing. Um, so, how do these immersive technologies actually affect perception? Well, 
The theory of specialization and sound localization has advanced, but the understanding of the cognitive significance of these techniques and their artistic implications, I believe, but I'm a little bit out on a limb here, but I believe it, they're, they're still relatively unexplored. And I mean, partly because it's only recently that it has become possible to spatialize music uh, and, and to place individual sound events in arbitrary positions in space in this way that we, that we actually can use, uh, that we can do now uh, using arrays of, of, of loudspeakers. And doing that uh, brings with it this, this, I think, really, really important property of, of immersion. But immersion is also the result of the mental activity of absorbed listening. So uh, Aidan Evans, um, an American musician and uh, scholar, says that an examination of this immersion may have implications that reach far beyond the world of music. And this is where I think it gets really interesting because... Uh, and, and I'm actually convinced of this, that the fact that we can do experiments in spaces like this that has impact on a lot of different kinds of fields of knowledge. So then, for the th some theory about this, um, Uh, there's a scholar, uh, William Gaver, uh, who wrote a, f a few, I think, important articles in, in the early 90s, one of which is, is this the, that I will talk about a little bit about what do we hear in the world, an ecological approach to auditory event perception. So at this time, the ecological uh, thinking wasn't as prominent maybe as it is now, so this was uh, quite groundbreaking at the time. And the general idea here is the sound invokes the listener to create space. So it's so slightly shifting the perspective around. It's not that we perceive space through sound. Sound makes us create space. So what, what Gaver does in, 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 in these articles, then he, he does a sort of a... <laughs> Uh, an ontology and sonic ontology and categorizes sounds according to their means of production, suggesting that a reduced listening may not be meaningful, instead pointing to a holistic view of sounds. Uh, so, you know, some, some of these, uh, s uh, s the ontology then can be based on, on the means of producing the sounds. And he divides sounds up into sounds produced by gases, by liquids, or by solids. And this is, you know, well, if you think of it, if you think of sounds made by water, they're actually quite distinct. Uh, in their quality. And one way to know that is that I think it's fair to say that we can all imagine what it sounds like if I splash my hand in water. So we have, it's, it's already encoded. And sounds by gases, you know, hearing the wind blow, for example, is also one of those sort of really archetypical uh, uh, kinds of sounds. And what Gaver uh, theorizes is that that the, uh, these are sounds that we can perceive, and we perceive not only the way they sound, but we also perceive the uh, materials that produces the sounds. So then, uh, so sounds produced by solids hitting a marimba, for example, may be recognized both in terms uh, of its sonic impact, but also in terms of the physical properties that gave rise to that sound. So liquids, water drops, rains, or gases, uh, winds. And they, they did some, some tests here. And it's, it's, it's fascinating how well people can uh, quantify uh, or, or, or perceive sounds uh, in this way. So that even, even to the... To the level he did this test with, he had recordings of people running upstairs and running downstairs, and there's a 95% accuracy when people do b b listening to that, and where they can say whether the person ran upstairs or downstairs. 
And, of course, there are many tasks with blind people that have uh, often uh, uh, gets to have a, a, a heightened uh, sensibility to sound just because they need to, because they can't see. So then, you know, this hierarchy of sonic, uh, of simple sonic events uh, that he builds is then based on sort of the vibrating objects, for example, or aerodynamic sounds and liquid sounds, but also the interaction with which uh, the sounds are being created. And this is also really interesting because we can imagine, I, I mean, I could take, if I had a metal bar here uh, and uh, uh, I would hit it with this. And then I would hit the same bar with a hammer. And we would record it with, with the same kind of technology. It would be very, very difficult to make this sound not convey that it was hit by little energy as compared to the sound which was hit with a lot of energy. So even the energy of the impact that produces the sound is in various ways encoded within the sound. So the physical energy used to produce the sound is an important quality of the sound. And this is not something that at least I haven't thought that much about that before. So different sorts of interactions produce different sonic characteristics that we use to specify the events, objects that uh, created them. So interaction influences time-varying properties of a sound. Um, I'll just make a short detour into uh, some other, uh, because I, I think there's a striking, uh, there's a striking resemblance in this uh, to uh, theory of image schemas that cognitive psychologists, such as Mark Johnson, have uh, uh, discussed. In which, so an image schema is uh, various embodied relations to various expressions uh, that makes us think differently of, uh, it, it makes us understand the word. So, so he has this example of the word out, for example. So I can have pour, pour out milk. That produces, I mean, it's, it says that there's an image schema. There's something uh, deeply rooted in my perception of the idea of pouring out of that, uh, um, uh, what's it called, of that um, concept. Uh, and my body participates in understanding it, even if I'm just reading it. So, whereas compared to get out of the car, uh, and I was just doing this this morning, I was, I, was, I was sort of experimenting with this, and I, I have a hip problem, so getting out of the car is painful. And every time I was reading that get out of the car, I, I felt this pain in my leg. So that's the kind of embodied relationship to various concepts that we have. So it's imaginable that we have the same kind of image scheme as to... Oh, there, there's another great uh, example. How many people can... Uh, uh, how many of you can imagine what it feels like to buy in a wooden table? Like, put your... Some of you can do that. So how many of you have bitten a wooden table in the last 10 years? Oh, <laughs> oh you have, okay. <laughs> okay, so, so, but, so that's one of those things where we have an embodied relationship to what it feels like to do a certain activity and we don't really need to uh, sustain that experience. I mean, we probably did it you know, between the ages of one and two, you bite everything. So it's, it's likely they theorize that, you know, that's when you code a lot of these experiences and, and they're more or less hardwired into your perception. So that, so, so in, in, for the rest of your life, that, those kinds of experience are influencing how you perceive the world in very important ways. Um, so, yes, uh, 
Yeah, so, 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 so here are some other examples. So scraping a surface uh, c produces one kind of physical energy, whereas hitting a surface produces another. Uh, and, and you can actually analyze and you can see that there are some uh, f frequency uh, properties of these different kinds of interaction that go across the materials uh, where you use it. So, so, you know, this is, this is a perceptual way of, of, of hearing a scraping and discriminate the scraping from a hitting. Um, so similar to this Gaver's ontology, the perception of sound, it may be possible to formulate an experimental spatial ontology, according to which complementary theory uh, sounds and sound producing events affords particular spaces. Now again, going back to, to the recording of the C, so, so that sound uh, affords a particular kind of immersive experience and and it's very difficult to fight against that and wind blowing is another such example a sharp hit on the other way on, on the other hand is 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 really difficult to get sort of like if you're using ambisonics it's, it can be really difficult to get that kind of impact if you want it to be immersive because the perception of it as a hit is very localized so your mind comes in and plays games with your perception. Now, of course, there's a, uh, there's a paradox here because the theory of uh, the ubiquity effect, so based on the paradoxical perception of a sound that we cannot locate but which we know is actually localized, uh, is almost at the level of, of these uh, semiological paradoxes. Uh, but but, you know, the sound of the sea is particular, but not localizable. You cannot say that, well, it, sound, it, it, it sounds, because it's, it's, like, it's huge, right? But those paradoxes are, I mean, ultimately interesting more than anything else. And this opens up for complex configurations of different aspects of, of, of sounds, uh, of a sound's element. Right. I mean, you could separate then particular uh, aspects of a recording of a sound and give it different kinds of spaces in order to model, uh, you know, a virtual space uh, and counteract the original sound's strong physical uh, relation or spatial relation. Uh, I'll just skip that, I think, and. So Eric Clark, which is one of the musicologists that brought up Gibson's uh, um, ecological theories uh, and brought them into music uh, in some years ago, writes that the various kinds of spaces, real and virtual, specified by musical sounds have until recently remained relatively neglected and unanalyzed compared to other attributes of music. So there is much to do here. This, I mean, there's relatively recent uh, reference. Uh, and I think this is a really, really exciting uh, field. And <coughs> so just to finally uh, give some, uh, some simple examples of an ecological approach to sound specialization would then be to allow, for example, immersive sounds to become immersive. So you play with the, so this is typical one, as, as Mantautas was saying yesterday, this is one of the really great benefits of, of ambisonics, for example, is to have a, that kind of immersive sound and stretch it out over a, a, a number of speakers like this, really evoke that feeling of being inside of the sound, being immersed by the sound. So allow directional sounds to uh, be directional. Now, this, is, this is, seems a little boring, but so you can, of, of course, try then to do the opposite in various ways. Um, and as I was saying before, then divide a sound up into its components and allow composants. <laughs> <clears throat> and allow each component to expand uh, its its own space, so that say you have uh, like a something dropping into water, 
uh, you can have the impact being really localized. You can have the uh, what's right after the impact maybe a little more stretched, and then what comes after completely immersed, and you create these uh, three-dimensional movements within uh, within one sound event. And you can create semantical connections between uh, the sounds uh, and the space. In other words, play with the narrativity uh, of of uh, a sound. So, typically, like if you have a, a if you have a sound moving, then you introduce the, there's a there's a narrativity in that movement. Uh, but you can also work compositionally, so that the way you lay out your material in a composition, uh, you attach it to uh, to various kinds of spaces uh, in a way that is consistent with the way you lay out your composition, so to speak. And you can map uh, energy of production uh, to space. So, you know, sounds with, with produced with little energy uh, has a certain kind of spatial configuration, and sounds with uh, lots of energy has another spatial configuration. Um, so, so those are a few of the things that I've been working on. But I mean, obviously, there's <clears throat> you can do many, many other things that can be done. Yeah, I think I'll pause there. So, any uh, questions or suggestions or reflections? Nice silence. Yes. I tried to speak <laughs> yeah. so you can hear me. Um, in speaking about this kind of encoding idea, yeah. do you find that working with ambisonics starts to encode things in any sort of different way than maybe just dealing with the natural real space? Do you, do you find any sort of differences, like, oh, there's a new way to think about this sound encoding onto my... Uh, sorry, yeah. That's it. That's oh, that's it. Uh, yes, I, I think. I mean, I think any technology has uh, has its own uh, sort of can introduce its its own possibilities. I'm not really friends with ambisonics yet. Uh, uh, I, I find it difficult uh, sometimes to achieve the results that I um, that I want. But but yes, definitely. And it would be. I think it's. Uh, I think it's problematic if we don't. I mean, I think it's really important in a in a technology uh, uh, l loaded uh, practice that that we're engaged in. Uh, I think it's really important to be constantly reminded of ourselves of of the impact of the technologies that we use. Uh, so. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's my experience. That's, that's why I feel. Absolutely.
what I want to do is just take a step back and see, you know, so how can I explore by listening and kind of how it all and then just bring that experience back in. Absolutely, yeah, then you kind of, right, you kind of somehow qualify a very deep, otherwise it's just the chaos. Yeah. And this is what's so interesting, I think, too, with these, uh, uh, these uh, paper and art is that it's not the kind of, I mean, so much of the, 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 the cheap mapping is an experience that lives on in the most of these different places. But they're completely into, like, the experience, but that's not in a methodological sense. Yeah, yeah, because it's just phenomenal. Presentation this morning, and we proudly present Staffan Mosselmark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I will give my presentation without any sound because I think it's enough with sound here <laughs> from everyone. So, um, we will have like I don't know, 45 minutes, maybe more, to discuss some, I think, quite important things. <laughs> For me, it's important, at least. First question, actually, to you. Let's see what you're saying. What's the purpose to work with art and music? Small question. But actually, what's the purpose? And for whom? Is the receiver of what you're doing? Can you think about that for one minute and just tell us the truth? Maybe it's very clear. Short one minute, so it's wonder if it's does anyone just have the answer? Your answer. I have an opinion. Yeah, <laughs> good. That's good. I always think that art stores some truth of a society or opinion or something I don't know. Like a desire for a relief in some area or, or a frustration or something. Oh, That's yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Other opinions or ideas of what it means? Do you have one? I saw your hand. We had such a long conversation about this the other day. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> can you try again? Can I can I fragment that? Yeah. Nice. Well, there might be no purpose. <laughs> it might just be an activity that we somehow need to do. That's encoded in us. Mm -hmm. That's a new idea we didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. it, maybe it's something like we have to drink water and we have to paint on the cave wall and drink yeah, uh, uh, the water. Know why. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh. Yeah. Anyone else? I know this is not very easy. You know, it, maybe you have just every morning you wake up, you have the coffee and say, I know exactly why I did it. <laughs> maybe. But then I as I said another part of this, okay, you can have a kind of personal idea of motivation right I hope you have a motivation okay. well I'm sure you have but this is only for your own as I say in your perspective this is only for you by yourself sitting in front of your mirror or do you have a receiver I don't know what I use that do you have thinking about okay I do this because I want to Quite. What I'm trying to say is, I have a de an idea that I think it's really important to understand why you're working with art and why you try to, I think most of you try to find an audience, someone to listen to see what you're doing. Most of you don't stay at home sitting in the kitchen and play for yourself and then just don't care, I'm sure. I think that's why you're here. You try to just give ideas, music to, to, to the group and say, okay, what do you think of this? Do you like that? Wow, wow, fuck, you know, that can help. Hmm? And I think it's, 
I think I say it is very complicated from my perspective. Like to be the professor of university is a kind of status and you know, ah, you're living in a kind of very small, closed environment. The university is it's only for people who is clever enough to go there, to get space and stay there. And often they come from, you know, middle class white area. They are already from the beginning winners. And many of the others is never get the chance to come there. That's a, that's a, I say, I say it's a huge problem. So as an artist, I say, we are some kind of supreme. We think we are so good. I didn't say the word. But it's just some kind of idea of that we are think we are very important. I say, I think I'm quite important. And I think most of you think, well, yeah, I do something very good. And it could be even better, and it's, that's why I'm here. So I have a purpose. Maybe you want to change the world, I don't know. This is maybe it's a big target, but what, no, whatever. Yes, some kind of. Um, I will just give you some small examples of what I say is interesting. And it's to try to get out from the university, to get out from the, the building, the small black box, from this kind of tiny church. I often think like art, this is like for believers in art. This is the same as like to go to the church. You have more or less the same ideas about it. You believe in art. That's good. But could be very dangerous too. If you, yeah. Um, as one example, um, one of the projects where we did to get with the Vilnius was um, between, I think here is like 12, five, five countries. The last, the second one, no, this is this the one. Okay, this is with 10 countries, students from Europe working together in here is this kind of the is public spaces, community spaces and, and to is it trying to where 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 can we present, build, make a kind of site specific uh, work. <coughs> to work without the music but put them in another kind of context outside the black box. And with a quite big possibility to meet a new audience. So here is one example. It's, this is actually from Gothenburg, 2012. Kind of, yeah, no, the swing place. Here was a kind of community place for other people. I know. I remember they did a light videos together and cooking food and make cakes. Very nice. And um, I think they. It was this kind of small groups working in different kind of spaces, and this is what one was on. Oh, it's very good, I think. So, did what I tried to show you here is <laughs> it was a kind of um, concert performance outside the barber shop. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if she's from here actually. So, it's a kind of to act directly in the front, in the middle of. of it was a boxing club. So that's kind of just try to find another way to, how to say, I think it's a big danger to, to stay in the art field and just to stay in the spaces where this is kind of deficient as this is the art space, the art hall, the concert hall, the black box. If you stay there, you totally, how to say, okay, your colleagues can say, I, I don't like your piece. This is the worst thing that can happen. <laughs> But if you try to go in another sort of situation, you, you really can see fantastic situations. People love it or hate it. I mean, really hate it. <laughs> and that's, that's just a good thing to, to, to actually experience. This kind of, okay, I may be not so fucking important as I think <laughs> I am, right? <laughs> oh, that's good. Sorry, that was one, right? No, Second right, minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, my language. <laughs> this is, yeah. <laughs> um, so again, back to what, 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 uh, what we are talking about is 
receiver? Who is the audience? It could be the audience can be someone somewhere else in another environment. Um, another example, I have. Uh, I'm um, actually I have two different kind of um, festivals. So artistic director for a festival in Gothenburg is called Gothenburg Art Sound or the Gas Festival. It's contemporary improvising, bar, that kind of standard, ultima standard festival. Nothing special. Good quality, but nothing. No? This one, I say, is more interesting. It says, I have a, it's in 2007 in, uh, in Verona, uh, a project where more or less everything will happen in public spaces, street squares, shopping malls, whatever. And everyone who wants to take part can take part. So I'm not I just artistic director say, I don't like that, you can't do that. It's not good enough. Everyone can take part. So this idea of democracy is say, reclaim the city with art, right? Give the city, the street, the squares back to us. Because one huge problem I say today is that public spaces, what we call public spaces, not really exist. It looks like open space, open square. Even a gallery I can see, oh, oh nice, this is my space. But no, this is, this is, this is a place is where is it, is it common lunch lines, is this gentrification is going around like you know animal we just take everything and the end is nothing no space for the free speaking world and I think that is so important you know the agora the old space for what it often for guys actually meeting in Rome or in antics and wherever in big cities to talk about important things that kind of space not really exists today Maybe you can say, oh, we have Facebook, we have other kind of stages today, it's digital, and we don't need the space. But I'm sure you need the space where your physical can be there. Say whatever you do, whatever you do, the purpose is of have a demonstration or rally, whatever, riot, I know. So that's why I say one way can be to actively uh, how to say the, the, uh, the streets and squares with art and music because we have a talent yeah, I think that's a good thing with artists we know how to do this we have tools we can compose music we can stage things we can produce things we're good at that most of us and that's just nothing that everyone can do so uh, then, then we're coming back to another part that I think is very important responsibility what kind of responsibility do we have as an artist? Do we have that? Or is this just uh, something we do? Or because we have special tools of expression to say things, to stage things, that's why we have to take a responsibility in another way than an ordinary city. You follow me? The guy who's working at the bank maybe have a problem to make a concert as well. You don't. Or to compose the string chord and to perform somewhere. So it's, it's about to be part of society in, in a democracy. I think we have a special purpose. I say. You don't have to agree with me, but this is what, what, what I think. So again, back to this. Here was, <laughs> for example, this choir was horrible bad. <laughs> it was really, I don't know where they come from, a church or something, I think. It was really, really horrible. <laughs> I remember my pastor was like, oh God. Yeah, but, but again, the purpose, open space for everyone. Everyone had the chance to have a concert in the public space. So it's not about quality. You have to just say, okay. And then, okay, good, we have another purpose. Then other parts, definitely good, but it's, this is it's a quite tricky thing as an artist to just avoid, yes, I have to put it, I like, we are looking for something else. We're using art 
because we are looking for something else. Well, that's a tricky one. I know that. So um, you have to just put your aesthetics away a bit and be very open-minded. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It looks very funny. I don't know exactly what it was about. <laughs> I, I don't have control of the whole festival. It's just a lot of things happens everywhere. And um, yeah, you see. It's quite far from Ultima or some kind of contemporary music festival. Here's this beautiful. They're playing in front of houses. That's very nice. About spaces, right? Yeah, you see. In the middle of the crowd. It's just kind of. But again, uh, uh, I believe in the thing is where you can surprise people, right? Oops. If you're in a public space, people passing because they are coming from the shop, you know, with their bags, what food or something, and then they pass it. Oh, there is a guy singing or dancing or laying down on the floor screaming at them. Huh? And I think that's very good because this is a way to. I mean, yes, very often stop and listen to music. I say they will never ever go for a concert for that. I have a contemporary music concerts in the middle of shopping malls and people just standing there. And I think it's like, this is really strange. But they stay there, listen, and look. Okay, sounds I think quite awful. But uh, is this, they're very good. Oh, they're playing very fast. Oh, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, but uh, I believe in that, uh, that when they see the things like that, hear things like that, they will put it in the, in the pocket somewhere and, and go from that. And maybe when they're back home, oh, it's really strange. <laughs> uh, you know. And then I believe in that kind of, when you start building up the field of uh, information like that, it's not happening just once. If you start working like that, things can move. I say. Um, right. Do you have any questions? Yes. <coughs> I just wanted, like, uh, have your what are your reflections on? Uh, I mean, we need to have a different space, like in the public. You also have, as an audience, uh, another kind of <coughs> attention because mm -hmm. you don't have the expectation of going to a concert and really just focus on the piece. Yeah. Uh, so I would guess you. Yeah, do you have what do you have to say about? Do you really perceive the music uh, in the same way? I'm sure not in the same way. Uh, of course, it's exactly what you're saying. You, uh, if you look like that, if you go for a concert, like we are going for a concert together, we're listening to each other. We have a context, right? And we have references, so we are know what we are talking about, and we'll listen and we we'll understand. When you're in the public space. Most of the people have no references at all. They don't know anything about what we're trying to do. And I think that's what that do with, with the music, I don't know. But I think it's interesting that actually, how to say? I, I'm sure many of the people say, oh, this is a horrible, I, I guess, walk. I don't like it, what they're doing. Uh -huh. But. It's, it's everything. It's as if, if you just, in 100 persons, yes, there's one person saying, oh wow, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. And then you, the person start to look for this area of, of art, art and, and music. And we have, it's okay, uh, maybe part of the, 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 the ideas is there. This is kind of beginning of something. So I think it's that kind of, um, I don't, I don't, I says, this, this is not kind of mission of to, to try to survive the or, or just give people a new purpose of life. It's not like that. Because I don't think art is so important, actually. I don't think so. So, so but I think it could be one part of, of how to be a better person, a better person to, to understand and reflect, to get the critical eye of things. Because that's very important to that, to have the critical eye. Sorry, in, in the time of populism. Yes, sorry. Yes, I have a question. But what about art? What about people who just don't don't think about these things at all? Let's say Chopin, I don't think he had a mission to change society or something. And do you think that it, it is in some way inferior to more social or political life? When you just it, write music for its own sake and yeah. you don't care about the world, you just... <laughs> <laughs> I, 
and I, and I, yeah, yeah, I know that this is this is uh, quite common, right? You, you do your music because you love it, and then that's it. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so of course, but I think, yeah, you can you can have a very correct and, and political strict agenda. Of course, you have a purpose why you want to do this, and then it's a more kind of political art, right? And maybe this is what yeah. I'm talking about, but. I still think it's enough to present not kind of special composed music for the space, even pieces which is not connected at all from the beginning to this kind of environment can be used. So it is depends how you stage it, how you produce it, and why you do it. So it's about the kind of idea of work site specific, even in the community spaces, to connect people, get involved in what you are doing and then you have a concert in a new environment. So it's uh, the worst of the, uh, the project, you can see this is like, you know, the kind of community project where artists going somewhere like the suburbs, so all these poor people living in these concrete buildings, we have to get on some art. Art is very important, you will, will have a much better life if you follow me. And they are going there, working for a week or two, huh? and then they leave. And they have to care of the people who stay. So this is, who is the owner of a space? Who is the owner of an idea of what we are talking about? This is so easy that we are saying we are. I am the owner. I know. I don't believe in that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Is it, uh, I agree with you on a few things, and I agree about this idea that there really is not much public space. <coughs> but are you saying that this has not been democratically decided? No. Do you know I don't say has? that. No, yeah, but, but, but if the idea is that we have a public space to enact the possibility of democracy in our mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. but maybe the democracy, the community, doesn't want the public space. That's true. It depends. Yeah, but, I, mean, I mean, what we see today, you know, every big city today, even smaller cities, uh, where I say before, so with gentrification and so on, the common, as I said, all, all spaces you can get to have a good drink, buy the new dress, whatever. It's good spaces. That, and, and they say, oh, this is a public place. You can walk here and you can shop here, you can drink. But people like this. Yeah. I mean, I don't like it, <laughs> and you don't like it, obviously, either. But, but a lot of people like it. Who are yeah. we to say that they, don't, they shouldn't like it? You know? now, I don't say they shouldn't like it. I think they just got used to it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, the good life. We have some, in, in Gothenburg, the politicians say, we want to have to do good city. That means the good city is a city center, clean, good shops, good cafe latte, and a beer. Mm -hmm. And a stick of soup. And they don't, I don't say they give a shit, but, but the, the, the suburbs is just, you know, Gothenburg is a horrible town in, in that kind of how you divide it like craziness. Very rich people, very poor people, a lot of shooting, the young guys killing each other in gangs. It's horrible. But we still have the Latin in the center. <laughs> so, so I think it's, I think it's discussion of what actually is, is public areas. What that means actually is that's a tricky one. That even as I have done quite a lot of big space as a kind of please, I would have to say um, projects in public spaces, like here for example. It's in, um, in Bergen, 2014, Norway, where we used a big area, it's actually like the square meters like that, uh, as a green grass carpet, where a lot of things happen. To make this happen, you need a lot of permissions. You know? <laughs> of course, <laughs> this is not just, even if it's like, oh, we are free, we can do, you know, for, for so on. To use your, your, your chance to have a good, you know, hang out here in the, in the sun. Um, but, the, so, okay, this is a kind of public space. It's a big square. Yeah. But of course you can't just take it out. Now it's mine. The police will be there in, in five. Ish. So, but again. Oh, but the green carpet was installed there. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's. I don't okay. remember that there was a green, uh, green strip. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was only for one day. <laughs> so the project I did here was with students from the university in, uh, in Bergen, and um, they we were made a lot of different kind of things happening all over the day with concerts, readings, 
cooking, uh, dance, no, 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 no. just to occupy an uh, area one day. Say, look at this. We can change this space like this. Easy. And I think if you do this every Saturday <laughs> and then every Wednesday, then, oh, then you're moving. And then you're, after a while, you're maybe you have actually it's our space. And it's what I saw here was uh, with one beautiful part we are playing. I don't know, the kind of football. This is beautiful, isn't it? it actually, good mixture even with, um, where I think it's just one of the biggest problems we still have, how to embrace the whole community. Not all. I said, we in Sweden said new Swedes. I more or less never ever see new students coming from Syria, Iraq, or Nevada. Middle class white guys and girls come every year. How to change? Because they are here, they're living here. The new in Sweden, new Swedes. I say this kind of public spaces is maybe a possibility. Well, they like here, by shark. Yes, you have to have that kind of chess together and um, yeah. Yeah. Not much music, maybe, but that's not important for me. It's actually not important what kind of expression we are talking about. It's, it's, it's more how to do it. I did a project with my with students from the university in Gothenburg at IKEA, okay. <laughs> and it was quite funny. You know, here you know you're looking for a new bed or a pillow or something, whatever you want to be careful. Don't go there. But whatever, if you go there, <laughs> it's cheap. And boring. Um, the opera class, sing yes, normal repertoire. But when you see them in that context, you're coming here, you know, you know, you troll it about this bed. What the fuck's Carmen here now? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's it's lovely. People have said, "Wow, really, 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 really. So it's about two years. It not have to be essential. So it's a kind of very extreme. It could be just oh here it's this. Uh, yeah, they're playing some kind of electronica in the in the restaurant. One guy <laughs> sitting in the middle of you know where you pick the boxes, playing <laughs> new songs. And 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 I think it's that kind of, <laughs> you see this is kind of I think it's it's quite beautiful because directly you change a bit. The result, I don't know. I don't know. This is definitely not a public space. It's a shop. But you can use shops too. And twist them a bit. But I don't say it's about to make space or to, to take more space. I say this is, I, I'm owner of my city. It's not about that. Here it's more just to put small, small signals of something else in areas where they normally don't find it. So, yeah. Uh, how, oh, how, oh. Oh. Uh, I, I yeah. Was yeah. I was just going to ask how you think of. You're talking about the, your audience or, or the receiver. Yeah. When you're thinking of a, a sort of an alternative performance space, let's say. Yeah. Are you thinking more about the space, or are you thinking about the people who use the space? And thinking about your receiver in terms of the space as the receiver or the people, that, the community that yeah. uses that space? Yeah, well that's a good question. I think it depends of, of, of the project, but oh, if we're talking about shopping mall, for example, then it's, it's, it's a shopping mall is not site specific, that why it's just a kind of format. This is a space where some, we have, to say, but we have some shopping malls, for, for example, in Gothenburg, where you can find. How to put it? The audience was coming from the suburb school in that. Mm -hmm. So I know I will catch people who will never, ever, ever go to the university. And that's a good purpose, I say. Then you can, of course, choose a space with this is interesting because this site specific place giving me something I can build the composition around or the performance around. So I think it's. 
uh, in terms of, of what we said specifically, it's uh, often, it's, of course, it's connected to the space. It's a high value, or the space looks like that, or sounds like that. It's going to be some kind of, so it's giving the piece or the performance something extra, right? But other parts, this is more about like try to, you know, try to connect. I don't know actually what, what try to do, but but <laughs> it's, it's it's too big. But for me, I've been uh, after many years uh, as a composer composing operas. You know, opera houses is always the same, same audience. Uh, contemporary music festivals, they're all the same, same audience. For me, it was uh, I had to do something more. This is not enough. No, no, that's that. It was kind of uh, I had to change. That's why I started to work in public spaces and then <coughs> in different ways. Now, what we are showing today is very much orientated to the university students as well. Other pieces I've done with this huge concept in public spaces. Like, uh, yeah, for my concept for 100 Holly Davidson's, for example. That kind of you take in a space and like <laughs> Uh, or I have a concept for bodybuilders. <laughs> yes, dragging uh, metal. <laughs> Lovely. Beautiful bodies, sound. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's that kind of, because this is what I call performative sound art, how to stage thing. The sound, it sounds like, yeah, normal, you know, pink noise, white noise. Yeah. <laughs> Not interesting. But if you put them in a package, with bodybuilders, hot man, working. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, I can't even do a picture. So it's, <laughs> sorry, uh, it sounds maybe yes. very, <laughs> let's see, I think I have it here. Uh, this is the concert. Yeah, yeah. You see? Isn't that beautiful? It's, um, this is in Bergen, too. And <laughs> you see, you know, it's just the rehearsal, you know, you have to yes, a lot of, you know, blood and alias, pump so yourself. <laughs> so, again, but you see, the iron is not the important part. This is the package. And I do it in the public spaces where people just passing and you see that's, have it, maybe <laughs> this, 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 that's the crew. Uh, I think I have a one from the first one. Actually, this space is only done twice. I, I do it every 10th year, so it's 2000 to 2010. Okay, so it's two years more. And, uh, it's just and I can tell you about this one just very shortly before we end this. Is they did a performance, it was like 15, 20 bodybuilders on top of this street in Gothenburg. They did the kind of normal performance they do, you know, showing the bottom of your muscles, right? Well, and after that, the audience start moving after that. So they was walking like a, a parade. It's a kind of rally. Bodybuilders and back here, hundreds of people moving together with the whole long street down in, in Gotham. So beautiful. And they were together. There was like, I don't know, they were going and talking to the guys. Wow, you know, big muscles. Oh, good guys. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a lovely thing. And... I said, beautiful. The guys were so happy because they have been, so that people like them. That kind of guys, you know, they're, you know, waiting outside the club, you know. I like that. And they're giving a lot of shit to you, die dumb in the head, you know, you're not funny. Great guys giving, I could give them something back, or I could, but the situation was very friendly to them. I think that was a good People are talking about this performance still <laughs> this many years ago, but it's kind of, you know, you're walking out from the club or you come from a restaurant and you say, what the fuck making guys working here? What's going on? That kind of situation. I heard what the old lady said, wow, it was just kind of, you know, I'm in love. <laughs> She's screaming. Yeah. And I think it's, and another heard was this, this big houses around the people living in, in, in the flats. Someone was just coming up in the balcony. They see, you know, 20 guys walking after like 200 people together with no flags, no nothing. You can't understand what it's about. She was just, what's, what's happening? What's going on? Mm -hmm. It's totally extreme. 
free day, you know, that the, you're sitting in the TV, walk, look at the windows. I guess, what the fuck is going on? And I think that's, it's very important. That's what you will remember. That's a kind of extraordinary situation. So I think that the kind of <laughs> some sensations is good. So, um, yeah, this, yeah, we we'll stopped with that. I have to stop now, but you, I think you understand what you are looking for. I think it's good for you to, to even if you love to be in this, this extreme black box with a lot of loudspeakers everywhere, think about why, why and where you want to put your music. And if you are interested at all to try to, to find a new audience, if you have a purpose with your music, could it be even to take some responsibility outside your bubble? It sounds hot and harsh. It's not like that, but I know the ego is big. I have still have one quite big. And it's very hard to just move outside that. And you said, say, okay. And I am, uh, the question is, I think, I am really, really sure I am doing exactly what I want to do. And, and is this uh, uh, a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing? Is this kind of, maybe you think of this every morning, I don't know, maybe you're that kind of person. But I think it's very important to try to understand. You put so much time in this. Is this so important as I think? Thank you very much. Party crasher, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So lunchtime, then we get back here and on this thing, not this board. I will write.